The biggest part of your chess ability is pattern recognition. Your ability to store a tactical or positional pattern in mind, then put that knowledge to use when the pattern arises later. We talked about the king and queen checkmate, which is often the first thing that any chess student learns. But many players learn to perform the checkmating routine inefficiently. Some would start with a move like queen g2, then shove the black king to the side or corner with repeated queen moves. And only when the black king is cornered would the white king step up to join the fight. That took 18 moves. But if white began with a surrounding move, a white that surrounds the black king, a move that sandwiches the black king between the white queen and king, it could take as few as four moves. Recognizing that surrounding pattern in games when all the pieces are on the board is often the best way to continue a checkmating attack. We looked at this Morphe game where 10 queen f7, a similar type of surrounding move where the white queen cuts off the black king's retreat while threatening 1194 mate is the right way to proceed. Recognizing a tactical pattern enables you to find some surprising moves. Against Miss Houghton in a 1914 simultaneous exhibition, Capablanca met the Dutch defense with the Staunton Gambit. In the 1913 Havana tournament book, Capablanca wrote that E4, putting a second pawn in the center against the Dutch, was the best move. After black captures, it enables white to develop with a threat and develop with another threat. Now there's a two-move threat to capture on f6, then e4. But if black ignores the threat, white doesn't have to carry it out. He can continue to gain time by allowing black to, ca to capture another pawn after which the white pieces come forward with the recapture. If white instead had played bishop f6 and knight e4, he's only one developing move ahead. But 5f3 plus knight f3 gives him two developing moves. And since black has to make two pawn moves to develop his pieces. That enables white to get three moves ahead, four moves ahead. White's four moves ahead in development when three moves is generally sufficient for a sacrificed pawn. White would like to develop his queen most actively by playing queen h5 check, but that means getting this knight out of the way. And he also has to eliminate the f6 knight, which guards the checking square. Black can play knight f6, because if white intended this exchange sacrifice, bishop f6 will guard the h8 rook in case of queen h5 plus knight g6. This check and capture pattern is a common motif when this rook is unguarded. But in this case, since the bishop does guard the rook, black can play knight f6 at move 10. And the same explanation applies to the 11th move. It's perfectly okay for black to play g6 here his knight g6 won't fetch because the rook is guarded. But black goofed when he played king e7. Most players looking at this position for the first time can't play queen f7 quickly enough. But in case of 12 queen f7, 
Black is going to play King D6, then King C7, then King B8. And the king will be relatively safely tucked away on B8. But when we recall that surrounding pattern, what we like to happen in this position is for black to play king d6 and then sneak the queen behind him to f7 when the king can't run back to c7. So Capablanca's trick here was a most unusual bishop h7. And the threat of knight h6 forking king and rook prompted Misutian to play knight f8, which not only stops the knight fork, it hits the bishop, which white self-pinned against his queen. But that's obviously what white wanted here. Is now after queen f7 and king d6, there's no escape for the black king. The white queen made the same type of surrounding move we saw in the king and queen checkmating pattern and the Morphe game. Once the enemy king goes for a walk, he becomes a great big magnet for our pieces. Our pieces just can't resist swooping in around the black king. This knight sacrifice can't be declined. Black has to capture that piece to get out of check. And then the d5 pawn doesn't stop the next knight check. Then king d5 is the only move. When black plays king d5, his e6 pawn is pinned, which enables rook f5 to bring the most force into the game. Black grabbed the second knight sacrifice, which let another white piece into the game with an attacking move. And black just keeps gobbling and capturing, and white keeps bringing up new force, and the black king keeps running. There's only one checkmating move here, the double check, rook d5. The d5 rook now covers d2, and the bishop on h7 covers c2. That's why rook f3 wasn't made, because d2 would have been a flight square for the black king. I can't stress this enough. Pattern recognition is the greatest part of one's chess ability, so the most efficient use of one's limited chess study time is to learn tactical, checkmating, and endgame patterns.